it is my absolute pleasure to declare the ninth conference, uh, ITRA conference, open. And with that, I would like to welcome up uh, Tim Walsh. So Tim uh, is a, a toy and game inventor and an author. And when we were talking, the more I would introduce him, the more I'd steal his thunder. So I'm not going to do that. I'd like to hand over for our first keynote to Tim Walsh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Serious play. Is this an oxymoron? How many people think that these two words contradict each other? Anybody? I didn't think so. If I was in a room of people who were not toy researchers, I think there'd be more hands up because as comedian John Cleese has said, there's a difference between the word serious and the word solemn. Solemn play, probably an oxymoron, but serious play is important play. And to that I say, is there any other kind? The name of this conference is Toys Matter, The Power of Play Things. I couldn't agree more. Toys matter because play matters. As Gary Landreth, the founder of the Center for Play Therapy said, toys are children's words and play is their language. Kids communicate their doubts, their dreams, their fears, their futures through play. Over the next three days, we're going to learn how to articulate that to others, take that knowledge that we gain over these next three days home with us. But when we get home, we're going to have our work cut out for us. Because by a show of hands, how many people here have experienced resistance in their desire to study toys and play because of the lack of the perception that play isn't of significance to be researched. How many people? Yeah, there you go. We all know it. Play has a PR problem. This is my play perception scale. So if your perception of play is poor, if you think it's worthless, then you are going to be annoyed by it. I'm sure we've all met those people. If your perception of play is petty, if you think it's really kind of fruitless, then you're going to be apathetic toward it. If it's positive, you'll be amused by it. And if you think that play is profound, if you think that play is the means through which our beings develop, the means through which we connect with the people we love, then you are going to be amazed by play. And that doesn't surprise any of us, right? We're over here on this side of the scale. We're here at the International Toy Research Association World Conference. We're at the Strong Museum, National Museum of Play, home to the National Toy Hall of Fame. No offense to my friends from Nuremberg, but we might be right now in the center of the toy universe. <laughs> right here, right now, right? But the question is, how do we get the people back at home in three days from now? How do we get them to move to this side of the scale with us? How do we get the people that are reading our grants and awarding the fellowships that we want, that are funding our research. How do we get them to join us on this side of the scale at the corner of amazed and profound? Well, I would like to offer stories, the power of stories. A Trivial Pursuit changed my life. It came out in 1981, and it changed the toy industry too, but not right away, because in 1981, Simon was huge for Milton Bradley, and Coleco had electronic quarterbacks selling like mad. Now, over the next three minutes or so, you're going to feel like this guy really doesn't like electronic games and computer games. That's not true. And to prove it, here I am, Christmas Day, 1979, loved Simon, loved it. But in 1981, Trivial Pursuit came out at the Canadian Toy Show and flopped. Nobody wanted it. And that's because electronic games, computer games, were coming into their own. And it, people in the industry were predicting this is the death of board games. And in 1982, the sales of Trivial Pursuit didn't do much better. That's because Donkey Kong was huge. And Atari shipped 12 million Pac-Man cartridges. Who's going to play a board game? And Trivial Pursuit felt quaint, right? It's cardboard, paper, plastic. It was told to just go in the corner and quietly disappear. But something weird happened in 83. Trivial Pursuit started to sell and sell and sell some more. They sold three million copies in 1983. So while technology was trying to redefine what we meant by the word connection, it was as if the play universe offered a course correction. 
Because how else can you explain them selling 20 million copies in 1984, a year later? There was a thousand cards in Trivial Pursuit when it first came out. 20 million games is two billion cards that Seltra and Ryder had to produce to keep up with the demand of Trivial Pursuit. To put it in perspective with another toy, in 1996, Tickle Me Elmo. Remember the craze of Tickle Me Elmo? Tyco made 600,000 copies of Tickle Me Elmo. Then the demand was greater than the supply, so they made more, 400,000 more. By the time Christmas came around, they were sold out, a million sold, and then the fist fights started with the adults. You know, I noticed in my history of researching of toys, it's the adults that ruin the crazes, right? It's the fist fights, it's the Cabbage Patch doll wars and all this. But the point is, a million is a big number in the industry, and that's what Tickle Me Elmo sold in 96. Picture 20 times the craze of Tickle Me Elmo, and that's what Trivial Pursuit was. And four years later, Pictionary came out. And the biggest accomplishment of Pictionary was it proved that the success of Trivial Pursuit wasn't a fad or a mistake or an anomaly. Because in 1988, this game sold nine million copies in one year, nine times the craze of Tickle Me Elmo. And it inspired two friends of mine and I to invent a game called Tribond. And simply put, if it wasn't for the, I owe my whole career, to Pictionary and Trivial Pursuit. If not for them, this game wouldn't exist, and I would never have this wonderful opportunity to speak to you this morning. So it was a great honor a few weeks ago when I got to go on the, the Toys That Build America and brag, because this season, the third season, they're talking about board games, and I got to finally brag about what Trivial Pursuit and Pictionary meant to so many game inventors like myself and so many people. If Trivial Pursuit knocked the door down to adult games, then Pictionary removed it from its hinges. Because now we go into any store, like a Barnes & Noble, and there's hundreds of games just for adults and families to play. And from 81 to 91, video games boomed, busted, and boomed again. And good old-fashioned board games never went away. Now, the video game players, you know, don't feel sorry for them, because they've definitely had their share of fun. Their little industry has done okay, right? They've, they've, they've done pretty well for themselves. And in this time period, they got to play a lot of games. But in 2011, they got to play a part in something much, much bigger. At the University of Washington, scientists there were trying to map a very sophisticated AIDS-like virus why do scientists do this? Well, if you can find out the exact structure of these proteins, then you can make medicines that adhere to it exactly, bind to it, and then it won't replicate. So it's a big deal to map these programs or proteins, but they're notoriously hard to map because they're tiny and complicated. The people at the University of Washington did something bold. They created an online portal called Foldit, and they opened it up to the video game playing community, the people that I just mentioned. They used 3D modeling and they invited these game players, these puzzle enthusiasts and game geeks to try to solve this 15-year-old problem that had eluded the scientists and the game players solved it in 10 days. 10 days from a video game. I first told this story in my book, Right Brain Red. It's Ren's book, actually. I helped him create it. His, Name is uh, Ren Geyer. He's the inventor of the Twister game. You may have heard of that game. And he's also the leader of the team that invented the Nerf line of products. So we put this book together, and one of his creative tenets is to be open, which to me is to be playful. Another big one is look outside. Look outside yourself, look outside your industry. And the, the, the scientists at the University of Washington did that. Faris Kahib said this about this project, although much attention has been recently given to the potential of crowdsourcing and game playing, this is the first instance that we are aware of in which online gamers solved a long-standing scientific problem. Play objects can be as sophisticated as an online 3D modeling game, or they can be as simple as a popcorn can cover. In 1938, Fred Morrison was at a picnic, and he took a popcorn can cover, 
and started throwing it around at this picnic. And he thought, this is fun, this could be a toy. But you know, flying metal tends to be a little dangerous. So that idea was grounded, he forgot about it. He entered the Air Force when World War II happened. And after the war, when the perfection of molding with plastics shifted, he and a partner invented the Whirl Away, the first plastic flying disc. Now in 1947, when the Roswell incident happened and UFOs and flying saucers were on the cover of all these newspapers, he changed the name to the Flying Saucer. But this saucer was very top heavy, it didn't fly very well. He and his partner had a falling out, so the next year when the planet Pluto was discovered, he filed a patent for the first modern flying disc and he called it the Pluto Platter. And it flew very well. Well, it got the attention of two gentlemen, Spud Malin and Rich Nur, the founders of Whammo. I wrote the, this book called the Whammo Superbook because Whammo is my favorite toy company. The Pluto Platter got their attention and they wanted to license it from Fred, so they struck a deal, but they didn't know what to call it. And in a bit of foreshadowing, I think, they ended up calling it by six different names, believe it or not. They called it Whammo Frisbee Pluto Platter Flying Saucer. <laughs> Today we just know of it as the Frisbee came out in 1957, sold so well, so fast, became so ubiquitous that I think we forget that it has spawned six different, highly successful sports. Ultimate Frisbee, now called Ultimate, is played in 90 countries around the world. It has a governing body called the World Flying Disc Federation. It is recognized by the International Olympic Committee, and I believe in the next five years it will become an Olympic sport. Ed Hedrick worked for Whammo for years, patented this disc catching device, which he used to popularize a sport called Frisbee golf. Today it's called disc golf. And you can find Ed's chain baskets in disc golf courses all over the world. And in this sport, it plays like golf. You're trying to make the fewest amount of shots to get it in the hole, or in this case, the basket. And like golf, you have to avoid trees, got to avoid waters, got to play the Elements, the wind, the PDGA, Professional Disc Golf Association, boasts 200,000 members from 54 countries. And these are people that make a living playing this sport. There's a sport called freestyle. There's a new game called uh, Can Jam, which is selling quite well. There's a game called Guts, which, again, look that up. Thousands of people get in teams of five, line up 14 meters from each other and throw the frisbee at each other as hard as they can. <laughs> and the other team tries to catch it. It's like dodgeball, but with the frisbee. Huge following. And that doesn't count the millions of people that just have catch, just play it for fun, right? So when I wrote the Whammo Superbook, I talked about time capsule toys. These are toys that deserve time capsule status, right? Lego would come to mind, Barbie, Monopoly comes to mind, Frisbee. These are toys that if you were to shoot them into space in a time capsule, and some alien race were to discover them 10,000 years from now, if they looked at these toys, they would get some insight into the unique human perspective. Ask yourself this, of these toys, which one is enjoyed by a different species <laughs> on our planet? And only Frisbee remains. So the man on the right over here, his name's Tom Worley. I'm going to read you an excerpt from my book. I'm headed to Arizona tomorrow. There'll be people there from Europe. We were in Korea last week. I've been to Japan twice, and all because of this piece of plastic. I know people who have met their spouses, married, had kids, all because of Frisbee events. Do you have any idea how many dogs Frisbee has saved? All these dogs were sitting in kennels, ready to be destroyed, and along comes someone into Frisbee, and they get these cattle dogs and these border collies, and they take them out to play. If you are amazed at what a popcorn can cover propagated, then you're really going to be amazed what a safety pin spawned. In 1963, John Spinello was a senior at the University of Illinois, he was taking an industrial design class, and he was given the assignment of coming up with a game or a toy. 
And John scored the highest grade in his class with this electric box. Now you can see there's holes and there's a groove in the top plate. What you can't see is there's another plate right below it. Also inside, there's a 12 volt lantern battery. Also a 100 decibel buzzer inside. How the game played was you took this probe here and you stuck it into the holes and the grooves, touching the bottom plate, making sure you don't touch the edges of the openings of the top plate. Because if you did, that 100 decibel buzzer went off and scared the living you-know-what out of you. So when John was given this assignment, he thought back to one of his first memories that really got his attention. And he was about five years old in a suburb of Chicago when he found a safety pin on his parents' carpets. He picked it up, and what did he do with it? He stuck it in an electrical outlet. Sparks. Obviously, he survived. But when he was given that that assignment, he said, I know two things right away. My game's going to be electric, and it's going to be loud. Because he wanted to scare some kids. He wanted to shock them. Now, he didn't want to actually shock them. He wanted to give them the exhilaration that he felt, and the, a little bit of fear, because fear is exhilarating, without all the, you know, the pain and the electrocution. We'll just keep that on the side. Well, he ended up selling his game to Marvin Glass and Associates, the Chicago-based a toy design firm, who in turn licensed it to Milton Bradley, who in turn ingeniously gave it a surgical theme and created the game Operation. It came out in 1965, and it was one of the first electric games. We kind of take it for granted that they're everywhere. I'll tell you a story in a minute about how that was impactful to people. So in preparation for this talk, I was doing some research, and I found this meme, which I sent to John. He thought it was hilarious. Forgive the curse word. I think he was successful in his, <laughs> his goal. Yeah, the pin. All of this from a pin. And you know what? The pin isn't even the best part of the story. When John was about 10, he was walking in Chicago with a buddy, walking in a suburb. He looked down. It was a very hot day. They wanted to buy a soda. They had no money. They walked over a sewer grate, and they saw all these shiny coins down there. And he was like, ooh. He said to a kid in the 1940s, that was a lot of money, nickels, dimes, quarters. So John found a stick. What a toy, the stick. I wonder if the National Toy Hall of Fame could have foresaw the way that John played with this stick when they inducted the stick into their hallowed halls in 2008. Because I mentioned, very hot day. What did John do? Well, he got some tar off of the blacktop, stuck it to the end of the stick, fished it down the hole, stuck it to a quarter, carefully took it out. Be careful not to touch the sides, because the quarter will fall back down. And before he was done, John and his friend had all the money they needed for their soda, solving a problem with a stick. Does this sound familiar, this game? A tool is put into a hole to remove an object, careful not to touch the sides. What we play with informs who we become. And the stick isn't even the best part of the story. So Operation went on to be huge. 45 million copies sold all over the world, multiple variations, international editions. Cavity Sam is the name of the hapless patient, by the way. He's a celebrity in his own right. Boxer shorts, greeting cards, shower curtains. Sadly, John makes no royalties from any of these because in 1963, he sold his patent to Marvin Glass. My dear friend, Peggy Brown, she's also a toy and game inventor. We became friends with John. And there was a show called the Chicago Toy and Game Fair. It rebranded as the People of Play, and they are a sponsor of this conference, by the way. Every year in Chicago, Peggy and I would go out to dinner with John and his wife. And a couple years ago, he mentioned that he was struggling financially. He had declared, he was a very successful warehouse owner in Chicago, and then in 2008, when the economy went bad, a couple of his tenants went under and took him with them. He needed surgery he couldn't afford. He was having neck issues and all these problems. And Peggy and I said on the way home from that dinner, you know, if all the fans of Operation just gave him a dollar, he'd have all the money he would need. So we did a crowd rise campaign for the fans of Operation to just thank John, and it went viral. 
It was everywhere. Al Jazeera TV, BBC, Good Morning America. That was one of my favorite stories. I, we became the media consultants for John because he was in his 80s. And all these people are trying to call him. We kind of had to be the conduit. His wife, Madeline, helped. I'm on the phone with Madeline. She's on, her, on the house phone with me. She's got caller ID on her cell phone. We're talking, and she looks at her cell phone and goes, oh, Tim, I got to go. Good morning, America's on the phone. So this went everywhere. So it was very successful. It led to this documentary film. That was the moment when Peggy and I said, well, you know, we got to film this because this is insane what's happening to John. So we did. Hasbro stepped up and bought John's prototype. So it's permanently in their archives at their headquarters. We set up a website and 3,000 email came in from fans of Operation thanking John for inventing this game. We got a letter from a gentleman. That's the cover of the original Operation game. It was a big deal, electric games. They didn't exist, so they called it out on the cover. This young man wrote to John saying, you know, I remember being about eight years old, touching the wrenched ankle. Remember, that was one of the ailments. I remember touching the wrenched ankle and the nose lit up immediately. How did, just like magic, how did that happen? And he went to the library and found a book on electricity. He was like, electrons, oh my God. It's a circuit, unbelievable. What does he do today? He's an electrical engineer. We received 32,000 in donations. John was able to get some new choppers, which was great. But the most meaningful thing in this whole story are the letters and emails that we got from medical professionals, nurses, doctors, physicians, assistants, even surgeons that wrote to John to say, your game led me to the medical field. Here's one of those stories, Dr. Steven Stryker. So when Dr. Stryker was a boy, he needed pretty serious surgery and he was worried about it. He had an aunt that thought, you know, I'm gonna give him an operation game because she thought the humor of the game would sort of ease his fears and it worked and he made a full recovery. And as he wrote in his email to John, I became obsessed with your game. If you think we're exaggerating, when we went to Northwestern University to interview Dr. Stryker, he pulls out his game that he had when he was seven years old. So Dr. Stryker literally credited his infatuation with that game for the reason that he entered the medical field. And at the end of his email, he said to John, thanks for all the joy you've provided, all the careers you've launched, and this is not a stretch all the lives you've probably saved. Do you notice what he does? He's not just a surgeon, he's professor of clinical surgery at Northwestern. He teaches surgeons how to be surgeons. We got a, an email from Dr. Goldstone. Little Andy Goldstone, like little Stevie Stryker, played operation as a kid, of course, everyone did, every baby boomer did. Jump ahead 40 years, he's in charge of head and neck surgery at Johns Hopkins University. And he wrote to John to tell him, you know, I was touched by the fact that you didn't make money on this game, but you're not bitter, and you choose to focus on all the joy you've brought so many people. Dr. Goldstone specializes in the thyroid gland. So he told us there are sensitive nerves that grow inside the thyroid gland. It's very easy to nick those nerves. And if you do that, if you cut a nerve or nick it, the patient can be, have a hoarse voice for the rest of their life, or even have paralyzed vocal cords, all kinds of complications. So Dr. Goldstone invented a device that sends an electrical current through those nerves so that when the surgeon gets too close to those nerves with his or her scalpel, a buzzer goes off in the operation room. His patent for the endoelectrotracheal tube, this device has been used in millions of surgeries all over the world. Okay, the best part of the story, finally. In getting to know John's family, we met his daughter, Lisa, who had thyroid cancer. And with her permission, we found out that Dr. Goldstone's device was used in her successful cancer surgery. What are the odds of that? The power of playthings. In 1993, when ITRA was founded, I was a struggling game inventor. I'm gonna tell you a story about a game that fell into my lap, literally, this game showed me the profundity of play for the first time. And I was in a classroom in 1993. My wife uh, was a teacher at the time, 
And uh, she still is, but she's my wife now. At this time, she was my girlfriend. And she said, can you come into my classroom and read to some kids? I need to take other kids out for year-end testing. And I said that I would. So I went in. These kids wanted nothing to do with me, really just. Every book I pulled off the shelf was like this groans of despair, like, oh, we've heard that book before. They just, uh, you haven't felt contempt until you felt the contempt of an eight-year-old. Well, to this day, I have no idea why I did it, but I grabbed a children's dictionary off the shelf, probably in desperation, and just read from like one of the first pages. I said, okay, quiet, quiet. What, what's the word for the nut of an oak tree? And this kid said, oak nut. I said, no, it's an acorn, but that's pretty funny. So I turned a couple pages and I said, okay, what's the word for a book of maps? And this little girl said, atlas, right before her friend who had his competitive fires stoked. And he said, read another one. So I turned to the B section and I read slowly the first meal of the day. And this kid said, waffles. <laughs> And I said, that's hilarious. I'm looking for breakfast, but that's funny. What sort of sorcery was this? 10 seconds ago, fidgety, frustrated, and in like seconds, they were leaning on the edge of their seat, listening to every word I said, literally hanging on my every word to try to answer correctly first. For days after this, I couldn't get this out of my head. I created a prototype called Definitions, later changed it to Blurt. And next year, 2024, we celebrate our 30th anniversary, just like the ITRA. So play objects can be as sophisticated and complicated as a video game or as down to earth as a dictionary or a pin or a stick or a popcorn can cover. And play can go away too, quickly or just slip through your fingers. In his book, Play, Dr. Stuart Brown talks about the trouble that JPL had replacing their older engineers in the 90s. These were brilliant uh, people that took us to the moon and they were getting ready to retire. So JPL hired young engineers to replace them and they discovered that the young engineers couldn't solve problems as well as the older engineers. And they wondered why is this happening? So they did play history interviews with both engineers and found that different generations played differently. The older engineers fixed bikes and they took apart radios. They made their own tree houses and made their own soapbox derby cars. The younger engineers, sadly, didn't. There's research that shows that using your hands develops your brain. Manipulative play, spatial reasoning, re rotating an object in your hands affects your brain, makes you a better problem solver. There's evidence that tinkering play for kids makes them better adult problem solvers. Keep in mind, this is not an intelligence problem. These engineers, younger engineers, were brilliant from MIT, Caltech, Stanford, very, very smart, but they lacked practical skills. This story from Dr. Brown's book is 20 years old. So how much more of a problem is it today with devices drawing kids away from tinkering play? What are kids missing when tinkering play is missing? Maybe you saw this video so this gentleman's not going to get a job at JPL anytime soon. The flight attendant, just turn the bag, sir. Just, there we go. Now, of course, I'm joking, but it is kind of sad, because if he just got a sorting block set, as a boy, he could have avoided being overwhelmed by the overhead compartment. When play goes away, we may lose an opportunity for a future career. We may lose something more. There's a a stage of play called cooperative play where kids learn difficult lessons of sharing and taking turns and empathy for others, right? It's also the stage of play where they build relationships with their peers. And if that goes away, it's incredibly sad. So the best games iterate over time. They're repeatable. And if a game isn't repeatable, it's either a problem with the players or a problem with the game. Now, if I invent a game that's played once or twice and never played again, problem is not in the players, it's in the game I invented. It's not a good game. But the game of House, House is a great game because it iterates over thousands and thousands of years. I think the original name is Cave. <laughs> millions and millions and millions of kids have played this game over centuries, right? 
But if I push my playmates over, if I steal all the play objects, so I want to be the dad every single time we play, and I don't want anyone else to do this or that, and I start bossing kids around, the play for me will stop because the kids govern the play if they're left to their own devices and well-meaning parents don't step in. I'll correct my behavior because I want to play so badly. But for whatever reason, if I don't correct that behavior, then play stops for me. There are researchers named John Coy and Kenneth Dodge who have researched this. And if you aren't socially integrated by the age of four, meaning your peers shun you because you haven't learned how to get along with them, you never learn it. And if you're five or six or seven and they try to remediate you and solve this problem, the efforts don't work. It's as if the developmental window has closed on you. And their research shows that these kids grow up to be aggressive, lack self-control, they're bullies. They're unable to handle stress because of something that didn't happen to them when they were four years old. Now my play perception scale on this side of it, remember it was poor. So people that really, I don't know about hate is a strong word, but people that really have a poor perception of play are very serious people. You know, we have things to do. We can't be playing around. There are things to be done. The irony is they're not taking play seriously enough. There is a negative aspect to play. It's not all sunshine and roses. There is a negative aspect to play that molds kids by correcting them. And that's why overprotecting kids and keeping them from ever feeling the sting of a loss, everyone gets a trophy, or the stigma of failing at play with their peers, if we protect them from that, then we also protect them from the forces that might mold them into the kind of people that are self-assured and they play well with others. It's really tragic. So there's been a rise in competitive or excuse me, cooperative games over the past few years, and I think they're great because team building is an important skill to learn, but I don't think they should replace competitive games at all because of what I just mentioned. Now, a competitive game like checkers has been called a zero-sum game. Now, if Mark and I play checkers and he wins, his win accrues to him what my loss takes from me, right? So his side of the ledger is plus one, my side of the ledger is negative one, we add those together, the sum is zero, zero sum game. But what that doesn't account for is all the things we get from playing a competitive game well, right? So if we're playing a game, we have to cooperate. I've even heard them called non-cooperative games. Checkers is a non-cooperative game, nonsense. We have to cooperate by saying, okay, you're not gonna sit next to me, you're gonna sit across from me. And we're gonna put the board in between us. And are, are you gonna be red or am I red? Do you wanna be white? Okay, you're red, I'm white. We need to cooperate. Are you gonna go two times in a row or should we take turns? Yeah, we better take turns. Can I take an orange out of the basket and use it as a play piece? No. There's so much cooperation that has to happen before a competitive game even can start. You know, in 1993, when Brian Sutton Smith and the founders of the ITRA got together, I wonder if they could have envisioned the struggles that kids have today. I don't know if they could have, or, or, or maybe they could, because Brian Sutton Smith wrote The Ambiguity of Play just a few years after the founding of ITRA, and he said this famous quote, the opposite of play is not work, it's depression. You've all read this hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times in your research. It's a big quote in our industry. I even saw it at a trade show blown up in the rafters once. My question is, when are we going to believe it? When are we going to believe that this is true? Psychologist Peter Gray, whose work I'm sure you all are aware of, has said that we are in the middle of a 50-year deprivation of play experiment. And he said it so long ago that now it's probably 60 years, right? It started with the erosion of free time for kids, made worse by educational systems that focus just on test scores, made worse by well-meaning parents that overprotect, made worse by unabated access to the internet, made worse by social media, made worse by social contagion, and on and on. It's up to us. The adults in the room are gonna be judged by how they treat those in our society that are most vulnerable. 
I think it's time to get serious about serious play. Thanks.